when I was 14, I had the opportunity to move to, to, to the, some of the biggest clubs in England. And at the time I thought, oh, maybe this is, this is normal. And this is just like the next step of, of what I need to do. And when you get an opportunity like that at that age, to move to one of them clubs, you you don't really want to say no. Like no is is literally not an option, and it's just deciding where you want to go and where you think is going to be best for you. So, um, yeah, all right. Yeah, good. Uh, happy to be here. I've been uh, looking forward to doing this ever since I've since I heard that I had the opportunity to do it. So, yeah. I'm no, we, we appreciate the going. time. Um, so to get us going, Jan, how do you think self-belief links into modern day football? I think it's one of the biggest things in football, if not the biggest. I think you get to a to a certain age and you've you've trained your whole life and technically and, and physically and stuff like that and then I think at some stage self-belief is, is the most important thing I think there's tough times and there's good times but I think everywhere everything you go through the main thing you have to focus on it is your self-belief and, and to believe in yourself because at times people are are not going to think you're good at times people are going to think you're the, you're the best in the world so I think yourself you have to believe in yourself and, and, and just get through any, any situation that, that you face. Um, as a young player, you were, you know, you've been involved in, in academy since you were 10. Um, did you have self-belief back then or do you think it was something that's developed over time? Um, I think when I was young, I, yeah, I always thought I was, I was good. I always, I always knew myself I was good and I had, I had self-belief and I had confidence, but I think when you're growing up, it's easier to have self-belief because you don't really pay attention to what people are saying. And I think when you get older, that's when it, it starts to become become tough when you're faced with challenges and, and not playing as much. I think when you're young, obviously you're playing week in, week out because it's it's rotation and, and stuff like that. You can make as many subs as possible. So I think you're always playing. And, and if you're doing well, I think you never doubt yourself. You never even question your self-belief. But I think as you get older, you can start to question it more when maybe there's games on weekends and you're not playing and a couple of weeks go by and you're not playing. I think that's when your self-belief really gets tested and I think that you have to stick by yourself and believe in yourself because when the opportunity comes, you have to take it and that's your opportunity and that's what you're going to get, get um, like questioned on when you get the, the opportunity. So I think the main thing is to keep your self-belief and always believe in yourself because your opportunity is going to come and then it's down to you to take it. So, the, um, so but like we'll, we'll talk about when you were, obviously when you were a kid, sort of that, that 10, year, uh, you know, 10 years old to, to 15 years old. Um, you spent time at West Brom at that time, yeah. weren't you? Um, you were obviously like extremely talented at that age in and amongst other talented guys. Yeah. Were you excelling at, at that point? Like you, you must have obviously felt good uh, about yourself. Yeah, I think growing up in, in all the age groups when I was at West Brom and, and when I was at Liverpool, I was always one of the, the better ones in my age group and I knew that. I think in training every day I was proving that and, and in the games I was proving that as well. So like I said, when I was young, my, my self-belief never really got questioned and, and, I, and I always had confidence. I always had a lot of self-belief and my, uh, my parents would always tell me to, to believe in yourself and have the self-belief because ultimately if you don't, then how can you expect like anyone else to? So I grew up on that and, and I always had confidence and a lot of self-belief. And like I said, when, when you're young, it's easier. When, you, when you're the, when you're showing every single week and every single game that you're one of the better players here. So I think, like I said, when you get older, you can start to question it more, I think. But as long as you have got that self-belief and, and drive within yourself to know that you are good enough and you do, do deserve to be here, I think it, it makes it a lot easier when you do step onto the pitch. There, um, there's probably listening to this, obviously young kids, older pros, who may have questioned themselves from like from an early age. Like I know my, you know me personally, I I wasn't 
anywhere near as as you know as confident as as what you were at an early age. Um, was there any examples that you could give us of times where you slightly doubted yourself, or, or was there literally none of that? No, of course there is. I think there's times when now when I'm playing in the professional game, there's sometimes weeks go by when you haven't you haven't played a game, you haven't been on the pitch, you've just you've just been on the bench and watching games, and of course you can start to question why it's happening because there has to be reasons why it's happening but ultimately I think for me I'm I believe in myself and I know that like through 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 hard times and when you're not playing as long as you you're giving everything every single day and 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 growing through this period and maybe putting your mind to something else maybe get get fitter get stronger and and just do other things away from football and just work on something else while you're not playing games every single week I think that's the best way to look at it and and even just getting stronger or getting fitter or, or educating your mind and just growing doing something else I think that 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 helps keep your self-belief because you know that in some aspect of your game or off the pitch not always just on it you are you are improving so that's definitely gonna help your self-belief and, and when you do step onto the pitch you've been working on other aspects of your game which is which is only going to benefit you the um at 15, like it's it's not often that 15 year olds obviously are, are involved in elite academies like you were. Not only involved in elite academy, but you obviously end up moving from one elite academy to a, to a better one. Um, during that period of time, like how did you find out that other clubs were interested in you? How did that make you feel? And and you know what did that do to to your to your confidence and, and to your game? Yeah, so. Like I said, when I was at West Brom and, and going through the ages from, from under nines all the way to I think I was there till under fourteens, I was I was always one of the better ones in my age group. My uh my team back then at West Brom was, was a really good one and there's some boys who have gone on to be professional now as well. So like there there was a few of us who were really good and I and I was always up there. So like I said, I was always confident and I and I always knew I was good and when I was when I was fourteen, I had the opportunity to move to 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 the, some of the biggest clubs in England. And at the time, I thought, oh, maybe this is this is normal, and this is just like the next step of of what I need to do. And when you get an opportunity like that at that age to move to one of them clubs, you you don't really want to say no. Like no is is literally not an option, and it's just deciding where you want to go and where you think is going to be best for you. So. Looking back on it now, it, it's obviously not normal, and not many people get that that opportunity. But at the time, I just thought this is this is the next step, and it's just a natural progression to to move on to to a bigger club. But looking back on it now, I'm super proud to obviously say I, I went to Liverpool when I was 14, and and I had a good time there with with some of the best coaches in England, and obviously some of the best players in in the world, not just the country, because Liverpool bring players in from all over the world. So I'm playing with players from different different countries and and obviously that's that's amazing and it's something I've experienced and, and I'm better for now. I think it's helped me and, and made me the player around today. That um that experience is, is probably something that all kids at that age would, would want to replicate. Um but I would argue that they don't know the sacrifice um that comes with that. What at that age, what specifically changed in your life? Um and and how did you deal with that? Yeah, so obviously at 14, I knew I had the opportunity to move to, to Liverpool, Arsenal and, and a few other clubs. I, I decided with my family that Liverpool was going to be the best one for me and I didn't really think of anything else apart from obviously putting on a Liverpool top and, and playing for Liverpool. But then when you actually move there, the reality hits and I'm 14, I'm, I've moved away from my mum and dad and, and my brother and sister, so I don't see them. I see them once every two weeks if I'm lucky once a week so for the first for the first six months like not many people know but it was a big struggle I used to like cry when I had to leave to go to school in Liverpool I used to cry when I had to when I was in my uh my digs and and I and I weren't with my mum and dad obviously and for the first six months it was tough and my mum and dad would would say to me like obviously it's gonna get easier you're just getting used to it and and there was right but at the time the first six months was was bad and I weren't really enjoying my football and I weren't my normal self obviously because away from football I weren't happy and I was missing my family and I, I was only 14 so now looking back I probably should have thought about 
everything that's going to come. But at the time I was 14 and I just wanted to play for Liverpool. But after about six months, I started to get used to it. And and my mum and dad would come up more often just, just to make it easier for me. But yeah, for six months, it was really difficult. But after that, I did, I did get used to it. I started obviously making close friends with some of my, my best friends now who, who are up in Liverpool. And once I started to make friendships and obviously I was going to school in Liverpool, so I was making friends outside of football. So that made it a lot easier, but the first six months was, was tough. Those experiences that you, obviously those tough times at that age, you think have helped you, helped you now? Yeah. Like when I, when I went to Liverpool, I, I left West Brom for, for six months. So I hadn't played football. So that's another thing I was, obviously I was unfit. I was I couldn't show what I could do straight away when I got there because I hadn't played football in six months. I was I was unfit and and I weren't my normal self. But like I said, looking back on it now, I went through that. I went through missing my family and that 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 has made me the person I am today. Like I appreciate my family more when they come to Swansea or when I go back home. I I appreciate the time I spend with them because I know what it's like when when you don't get to see them and and it's tough. So. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise that now when I am with my family, I really appreciate the time because that's the most important thing to me. Yeah. The um, stepping up into, into an academy like Liverpool, I can imagine as well, like you're now surrounded by better players. Um, being in that environment, going from being the best player, um, so obviously I don't know if you were the best player at Liverpool, but being surrounded by better players, was that, how did that feel? Like, uh, did, you, did you question your own ability or, or I can't imagine you did, but how did that feel going into an environment where everyone around you seemed to be, you know, a bit better? Yeah, I think when, when I did first go to Liverpool, I was, I was confident in myself that I would, I would go straight there and, and be one of the better players again. And, and I was, my team was at Liverpool was, was really good. And there was a lot of good players and people from, all over the all over the world, like I said, but I was still up there in in the better players of the age group, and we had such a a talented team. And like I said, once I got my fitness back and and I was able to show what I could do, it was it was similar to West Brom. Like we had four or five really good players, and we just we beat literally every team we played against. So we had a good team, and I was always one of the better ones in the age group, and I'd be one one of the ones who would play up play up an age group and, and play with the older ones. So, like I said, once I got my my fitness and that back at Liverpool, I was, like I said, I had the confidence and the self-belief and I was and I was the be- one of the better players and I managed to, to have a good time there. When, um, when was it that you were there that you started um, being around the first team and having access to them um, and training with them and experiencing, you know, mi- mixing with, with the obviously top, top elite players? Yeah, so at the time when I went to Liverpool, obviously Brendan Rodgers was the manager and I was training quite often with the first team. I was like 16 and I was coming out of school to, to train with the first team and then... You were joining the first team at, at 16? Yeah, so it would be like, it wouldn't be every day. If they needed a player, I would I would go up there and I'd, and I'd, and I'd train quite a bit like for, for the age I was and, I, and I'd done well there and I enjoyed it there and I was training with obviously some of the best players in the world and... That's something I'll never forget. But like I said, when I was that age, I, I had the the confidence to go there and just express myself and, and show what I could do, and and I enjoyed it. And like I said, I done well, and and Brendan knew who I was, and and his staff knew who I was, which was which was so good at that age, especially. And <clears throat> that was a big a big learning curve for me as well, training with with those sort of players and getting to see them every day and interact with them and stuff like that. Uh, um. At 16, training with the likes of, you know, the, the first team players at Liverpool is so scary to, I would argue, 99% of people. But you've just spoken there about how you were, you know, you, that you felt confident, you felt good, you expressed yourself. How do you think that you managed to feel that way instead of being one of the guys that were nervous or anxious and, and, and felt like that? I just felt like, obviously, I'm 16 going there training with the first team everyone knows I'm 16 and I'm coming out of school to train with the first team like literally I had I had nothing to lose I was 16 years old training with some of the best in the world and I was just seeing is it seeing it as if I made a mistake they would understand that I was young and I was just trying so like my my dad has always told me to just like 
express yourself and 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 be be yourself and and do what you enjoy what what makes you happy so i'd just go there and express myself and and do the stuff that made me happy and that's when i was at my best when i weren't thinking of what other people thought and just doing literally whatever made me happy and that's i think that's why i done so well when when i was training there because i knew i was young and i just i thought i've got nothing to lose and just have fun can you um can you remember any moments in during that period of time um like 16 17 18 years old of of being around those guys and picking different things up and and ha- or having conversations with any of those players that helped you uh, i can remember a couple of things actually so i remember one time i was in i was in an english lesson at school and i and i like sneakily i, I checked my phone and storage followed me on instagram and i was just like so happy telling everyone and, like i couldn't even concentrate in the in the lesson because I've just checked my phone and, and storage had followed me and because obviously he's from Birmingham so straight away when he seen me and 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 he must have heard me speak and knew I was from Birmingham so straight away he like put an arm around me and was just and and stuff like that makes you feel feel better and then a few weeks later I see Coutinho followed me and and I was just like obviously I'm I'm, I'm 17 16 years old and when you're seeing people like this follow me it's like they must have like have appreciated me and and thought I was I was a good little player and and I had they must have thought I had some confidence to go there and, nice and, little confidence and express yeah. myself yeah so obviously when stuff like that happens your confidence grows your your self belief grows and you're on top of the world really so yeah stuff like that sticks out for me and then I remember uh, I went to a because Trent Trent Alexander Arnold's one of my close friends so. We went to school together and everything. So when we was there one one night after training, we was like seventeen or something like that, and we went to a to a Justin Bieber concert and we seen a uh, Coutinho, Firmino, Lucas, Moreno. They was in a box at Justin Bieber and they seen us and and they they brought us into the box as well when we was like seventeen or eighteen. So just to for them to obviously let us chill with them and, and watch a concert with them in, inside a box at 17, 18 years old is n- something not many people can say they've done. Yeah, that's nuts though. Yeah. Um, what happened to your football during that time as well? Like, what did, were you picking any up uh, training habits? Was, you know, were there things that you were seeing these guys do that you wanted to replicate? I just seen that obviously Coutinho and Sturridge are people that I really looked up to. I still look up to them now. I think when I can remember watching them train, they was just having fun. They didn't care about what people said. They didn't care about what anyone thought. They was literally just doing whatever made them happy on the pitch and doing tricks, doing skills and smiling. And that's the biggest thing. I think when you're, when you're on the pitch and you're enjoying it, that's when you're at the best. Your best. And, I, and, I, and that's what I've realised with myself now. I think obviously there's times when you're angry, when you're not playing and you can get annoyed when, when things aren't going your way. I think that that only affects you on the training pitch, and I've and I've realised now as as I've got older, because obviously some things did affect me when I weren't playing, and and I did let it get to me too much. But now I've I've kind of noticed growing older as when I'm when I'm on the training pitch and I'm smiling and I'm happy and I'm and I'm doing what what I like, then that's when I'm at the best, and when I'm at my best, then that's all I can do, and that's when I'm showing like what what I can bring and what I can do for the team. The um, I mean your talent, your ability. How did you manage to use it to be effective on a match day? And and by that I mean obviously you've just spoken about playing with freedom, about enjoying your football, um, training and watching these guys perform. But obviously to be effective on a match day, to you know to to contribute to winning matches, to contribute to by scoring goals and and assists. How was it easy for you to to combine the two? It's in your talent and being effective, or or was that something that you had to develop over time? Yeah, I think it's something you have to develop over time. I think especially when you're young, coming into a first team or joining a new club. I think, of course, at first you have to settle and find your feet and and build relationships. And I think the biggest thing for me was when I started to build relationships with with my teammates and started to show in training, especially what I can do. I think then that's Ultimately, when you go on the pitch and, and you start to express yourself, when you know your teammates know what you're going to bring to the team and 
what's going to make you different to everyone else. And I think, obviously, in games, sometimes you have to sacrifice your own game for for what's going to be right to get the three points. Or maybe you have to play a bit more defensive when you're winning or stuff like that. But I think it's important to know that when you get the opportunity on the pitch in the in the areas where that's what makes you different, I think it's important to express yourself and show what you can do and not be afraid of, of losing the ball or making a mistake because ultimately I think when you're too focused on making mistakes or pleasing other people, that's when your, your game starts to get affected and I think you have to just, like I said, in the right moments, do what, what makes you happy and what makes you different to everyone else and that's what's going to separate you. I'm hoping that people obviously can listen to you speak and your journey and, and what's made you successful and take a lot from that because there's a lot of guys playing who, who don't have that, uh, you know, attitude that they, they probably are a bit safe or, or they do look to, um, to, to not express themselves and, and stuff like that. So hopefully when obviously that the success you've had and the, you know, the, the personality you, you have will, will resonate with people. Um, but it seemed by the age of about 19, and it's pretty rare in, in the game for, for somebody to seem like they have continued success um, and that there's al- almost no setbacks. Um, until the, obviously up until the age of 19, was there ever, did there come a point where you thought I might have to leave Liverpool or um, like, how did that come about? Uh, it probably was when I was about 19, you start to think like, how realistic is it that I'm going to play for the first team and and make a name for yourself at Liverpool and go on to play regular first team football here because obviously it's such a big club. You're playing with some of the best players in the world, if not most of the best players in the world. So I think that you have to make a mature decision on, on what's best for your future. And obviously at the age of 19, I started to think, what is going to be best for me now. And I think that I had an opportunity to to move on and, and, and I had some clubs there ready to ready to take me. And like I said, with my family again, I made a decision that, that Swansea was going to be the next step for me and the football that Swansea are known for playing was, was going, to be, going to be what suited my style of playing the most. And like I said, I haven't had no regrets so far, I'm 22 now, and I think moving to Swansea was the right decision. I've made progress and each year I've been here has been an increase on, on my career and I've played more games year by year and I think that the coming years I'll, I'll play even more and and really like push on in, in, in my career because that's ultimately what, what I want to do. But I think there was a time at Liverpool, I was I think 17, when I had, I had quite a bad ankle injury and that's when I was coming back from that I did start to question like like we spoke about the self belief and and confidence and obviously when you come back from five months out injured you you're not fit you're not sharp and when you are coming back you you're obviously you're not at the pace and I and I started to think like how long is this going to take me to get back and up to speed and but like I said I, I realized from a young age that when when you can't control things on the pitch maybe just work on something away from football and that's when I started to, to really work on my my fitness and, and strength and conditioning and stuff like that and I was putting a lot of effort into that and working away from the club that I managed to get myself fitter than expected and then I was back playing games and, and like I said uh, started to really progress again from then so like I said there has been a, a couple setbacks but I think from from a young age because I've had such a supportive family I've, I've dealt with it well and and managed to, to find my feet and, and really push on again. So you managed to overcome, obviously during that period of time where you're injured and, and you had, you know, uh, an element of self-doubt, you managed to overcome that period by working harder, um, by training harder, by getting fitter. You, you used that as, as a way of coping with, like, obviously the doubt that you felt. Yeah, because I think from a young age, my my, uh, my family, like, have, have always told me to to just find confidence in maybe doing something else and obviously if you're working on your fitness you know yourself I'm getting fitter I'm getting stronger so ultimately you're telling yourself like I'm improving so your confidence and your self-belief is going to slowly start to grow and for me when I when I got my fitness back I always knew what I could do with the football and on the pitch so at that time it was 
to work on my fitness and to work on my, my body and ultimately gain confidence from that. And once I'd done that, I was back playing. And once I'm on the pitch and I'm fit, I, I know what I can do. And then obviously from then you don't really start to, to doubt your self-belief or your confidence until the next setback occurs. And then when maybe the next one occurs, when I weren't playing as often as I thought, I'd, I'd, I'd do something else to, to gain the confidence, like I said. and Or even just see my family makes me feel better. And stuff that makes you feel better is ultimately going to going to help you on the pitch um there's a lot of guys that young players that will be at different stages of their career um that will find deciding to move clubs or to you know find a decision that helps their own career pretty difficult to, to decide um do you remember how difficult that was for you for you to decide that and for people who don't know and, and won't be aware how does a conversation like that happen like well, how do you approach liverpool uh, about that I think that it weren't it weren't really that difficult for me. I think obviously you want to spend as much time as you can at, at big clubs like Liverpool and obviously you're living the dream and not many people get to put on a Liverpool kit but I think from quite a young age I had a, a mature mindset and I and ultimately I just thought that I wanted to play football and I wanted to make the next step in in my journey really and I think it made it a bit easier for me to move to Swansea because at 14 I moved away from my family to Liverpool so moving to Swansea at 19 wasn't really that difficult in terms of moving to a new place because I'd done it before so I'd experienced it and and I knew what it was like I knew that as soon as I started building relationships and making friends and having relationships with my teammates, it was going to be easy for me. So when I moved to Swansea, straight away I started building relationships and, and settling in as quick as possible, finding a house, because obviously that makes everything easier when you've got somewhere to call a home and you're happy. Away from football, like I've, I've spoke about, it helps you on the pitch. And I think <clears throat> when I came to Swansea, I was I was super fit. And and I know if I'm fit, then when I'm, when I'm training, I'll show what I can do. And that's what I did. I showed what I can do and I managed to to make my debut on the first game of the season so I must have done something right in the pre-season to, to show what I can do and I know that when I am on the pitch and, and, and training and, and people are watching that I will make a good impression and, and I back myself with that all the time. The um the period of time obviously well in, in that time then when you when you move from Liverpool to Swansea and and you're changing clubs um, I mean, you're a confident guy, but what was like? What was the mentality on on that move? Like, were you excited? What What was the ambition of when you moved to Swansea? You know, what did you have going through your mind? Yeah, I was super excited. I think because obviously there was a few clubs I could have gone to, but like I said, with my family, I made a mature decision on what was going to be best for my footballing journey. And I think when you got a team like Swansea that plays the right football and plays attacking football and attractive football then ultimately you're going to gravitate towards towards that club because it's such a it's such a good one and and then when I came down to Swansea and seeing what it was like in the area then I knew straight away that this is where I wanted to be and I seen the training ground and I seen the area and and the people and I knew straight away this is somewhere I wanted to be and somewhere I could call a home because like I said the a big thing in, in football is to be happy off the pitch. And I think if you're happy off the pitch, then things on the pitch like will just flow. And when you're training, like you don't have to worry about anything apart from doing doing your job, really, because that that's why you're here. And I think for me, it's as long as I'm happy off the pitch and I'm enjoying my football on it, then I don't have to think about anything else apart from just expressing myself and, and doing what I love. I am. Um... I'm interested to to find out in you steady young guy really successful but is there anything specifically that you do in training um in your you know your day-to-day life that people are going to be able to take young guys are going to be able to look at you and think you know Jan Dander's living his life this way this is what he does in training this is what he's doing in the gym um how did you like do you have any training habits that that you need to do um, like how do you approach training um, and what ultimately is, is, is your football lifestyle like to get the best out of yourself? I think 
everyone's different, but I think for me, it's when I'm on the pitch. Like I said, the the most important thing for me to be the best version of me on the pitch is to ultimately do what makes me happy and not doing stuff to make other people happy. It's and when what I'm, is that? What does that look like? What what makes you happy? It's just smiling, shooting. I like scoring, so I'm always shooting. It's being confident with the ball, taking people on, doing skills, just stuff that, that I enjoy doing. And other people's might be different, but I think the main message I'd give to people is to do whatever makes you feel happy. And if you haven't done it in the session, do it after the session. If I don't feel like I've taken enough shots in the session and, and seen the ball hit the back of the net, then I'll do it after the session because that's ultimately what's going to make me happy when I'm driving home is seeing the ball hit the back of the net and that's what gives me a buzz. So I think if I, if I do that every day, then I'm making myself happy. And like I said, when I am happy, then that's when I'm going to be doing the best stuff on the pitch. And I think it's easy, especially when you're young and you're going into a first team to do things that make not necessarily other people happy, but what you think are making other people happy. So if you've got the ball and normally in your age group in the, in the academies, you'd be going past people or doing step overs, but you've got someone in the first team shouting for you to pass it. The easier thing to do is just pass it. And I have probably done that a few times in, when I'm when I'm growing up, but ultimately you you you're here for yourself and you've got this far yourself and working hard yourself. I think that you have to show what you can do on the training pitch, and if you're not showing why you're unique on the training pitch, then you can't expect for for the manager to pick you, and he's not going to know what you're going to bring to the team. So, I think in each training session, it's important to show what makes you different to everyone else because every every player is different and everyone's good at different things, and that's why I said if some people's what makes them happy, happy is tackling or slow tackling or scoring headers. I think then do that because that's what's going to make you different to everyone else. And ultimately on the pitch, everyone has unique attributes and it's down to you to show it. How old were you when you um, realised that obviously the modern game now, you have to be super talented, with, you know, which you are um, technically. But physically, obviously, the game at the, the top level now, and you've played top level, um, and are, you know, right at the top of the championship at the moment, that the game's becoming faster, stronger, um, guys are fitter. Um, and you've spoken there about how much time you spent whilst you were injured, trying to get faster, trying to get fitter, trying to get stronger. How much time of your life do you spend on, on that aspect? Yeah, I think the past couple of years, and, and still now, that is mainly... What I do work on, I think, on the pitch, technically, and uh, my football smartness is is really good. And I think that that's what separates me on the pitch is my technical ability and the way I think on the pitch. But what I, I said to myself uh, a couple of years ago and what I've been working on with with staff at Swansea and away from Swansea is my physical and making myself as fit and, and as strong as possible that, that suits the way I play. And I think that that's obviously something that I do work really hard on because I think that you do have to be super fit and you do have to be strong in terms of what's needed and required for, for your position. So I think like working on explosive stuff for, for me in my position is something that I do a lot now. And I think if and when I'm not playing games and I haven't, played the day before then after the game I'll do something or the day after I'll do something just to make sure that I am doing something and staying as sharp as possible for for when I do get my next opportunity and I think that I've learnt my body as I'm growing older and, I, and, I, and I've been quite a late developer in terms of my body building and getting stronger and stronger but I feel now I'm, I'm feeling the benefits of what I've been working on. In, in, in the past couple of years and now I feel like I, when I do step on the pitch I feel a lot stronger and a lot fitter than, than I have been before and I've been working on that a long time now and it's it's nice to start seeing the benefits. Um, young guys will watch you play and you know you've got a lot of fans all around the world will see you play and see the technical ability and see as you're talking about the, you know the football intelligence and we'll just think that that probably are oh, everything's natural like it's all easy to you but we've been speaking 
here for a little while about how much you've dedicated and and how much you've sacrificed um and how your whole life you know revolves around football um is there any way that you can obviously sh- give advice to the young people listening or watching to this about how much dedication being a footballer is uh because i don't want them to to see you play and think that i oh, that's easy for him he's you know it's everything's natural he's you know he's he's super talented and that's it yeah i think obviously when you do watch football on tv everyone thinks it's easy and it's been a easy process and it's just they're doing what they love and that's it. but it's not it's not as simple as that there's a lot of sacrifices and there's probably more downs than ups and i think it's how you deal with with the setbacks and and how it's going to make you stronger and ultimately that's how you improve and that's how you keep your self-belief and your confidence is by not doubting yourself and and just growing through through setbacks and like i said for me it was when i had a setback i'd work on something else that that was in my control rather than focusing on stuff that that you can't control because ultimately you just you're just going to get annoyed and, and angry at focusing focusing on stuff that that you can't control but i think for for people who are growing up wanting to be footballers i think that it's okay to to go through tough times and it's okay to have setbacks and and injuries and ultimately it's just not letting them define who you are and just knowing that the setback's not going to be forever and you're going to come out of it and it's when I was growing up it was just to try and come out of it stronger and people say that that you'll come back stronger and but I think that unless you actually believe it yourself and it unless you're actually working on becoming stronger and and gaining something from from the setback then I think it's just going to be a waste of time and can like get a setback and 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 go into one with it and start doubting yourself and thinking will I ever get back to how I was or will I ever get to be a professional footballer and I think that ultimately you have to have the belief that regardless what comes in your way you're gonna really go for it and give 100% and as long as you give 100% I think if you fail giving 100% then you can never question yourself and nobody can ever ever question you. I am I think that's so you know really important that your message ultimately is that you end up taking responsibility for your own stuff yeah. um, and you don't leave that to, to other people and that's hopefully something that a lot of people can take because we've probably both had teammates in our careers that it's somebody else's fault or or this is the reason why this has happened um, but ultimately if you you know control what you can control then you're going to be in a much better place for it yeah i think that's the main thing there's a lot of lot of things in football that are completely out of your control and there has been times where I've questioned it and got annoyed at it, but I think when you when you take time and look at the bigger picture, I think the only thing that's going to keep you going is to just focus on yourself and the stuff that you literally have no control over and you can't do anything about it even if you tried. So there's no point really going into it too much with that one. And luckily, I think I've had good people around me from a young age that have taught me that and, and I noticed it quite early. So f- since I was made aware of this and just being told to to work on yourself and just focus on what you could have done better and how you can improve. I think then that's what's gonna gonna make you better and ultimately keep keep you in in the right frame of mind. Yeah. The um we've talked about how you've had you know quite a lot of success and you've just mentioned it not not so long ago. Um, but you're you know you make your debut. You come on, on at Sheffield United away and score. Um, what a feeling. Right, how, how was that? Yeah, I think that's a standout moment for me because it's like all the sacrifices I made moving away from home, injuries, uh, just small setbacks that I've faced and then obviously the goal was one thing and it was one of the best moments I've, I've ever had in football from when I was born up until now. But the main thing for me was to to celebrate the goal with my dad and, and, and my cousin, who's my best mate, was they were in the... was behind that goal, yeah. So it, it weren't even as if I scored in that goal and there was behind the other goal, but it was I scored in that goal on my first touch on my debut and my, my best mate and my dad was behind that exact goal. It was like everything just made sense and I'd gone through so much and this moment was 
was worth it and I'd do it all again just to have that moment again. So, like I said, when you when the ball hit the back and there, I was just thinking I'd scored and it was normal. But obviously, after the game, when I'm driving home, you start to think, like, that's not a normal thing. Not many people have even made the debut professionally, let alone score on it. And, and then to celebrate with my dad behind the goal and my best mate behind the goal after it is just like, that's what it's all about and everything I'd been through was worth it and, and it's it's the best thing that's happened to me. What um I'm interested to know, what happened to your um obviously you know confident guy, but what happened to your self belief after that moment? You just spoke about driving home and thinking like this is you know, this is special, this is a unique feeling. How did you how did that change your game after that? Uh so obviously it was the best thing ever and Obviously, the night the night after it, I was with my family, and it was just I was actually with my family, with my friends. I went out with my friends. I just enjoyed what had happened, and my friends enjoyed it, and we were just celebrating and partying and just just enjoying that moment. But then, obviously, the next day when you wake up, you just want to do it again, and you want to celebrate and spend time with friends and family because of stuff like this and it happening again. But after after scoring that goal, I, I didn't play again for a few weeks. The next game I didn't play and the game after I didn't play and it was weeks went by before I stepped on the pitch again. And like this is exactly what we spoke about. At times like that, you start to think like, why am I not playing? You start to ask yourself a million questions. And at the time I, I was, I was thinking, why am I not getting on? Why am I not playing? And starting to question myself like, how come this is happening? I scored and now I'm not playing. but when you're in the moment, it's easy to focus on the negatives. But I think when you come out of it and you look at the bigger picture, I think like we spoke about, just focus on what you can control. And that was in training every day, showing what I can do and, and waiting for the next opportunity. And I was only 19 at the time, so it probably would have been a bit much to be playing every single week and every single week. And I realised that and I, and, I, and I took a step away and, and looked at the bigger picture and thought, all right, when I get my next opportunity, I'll try and do something again. But like in the, in the moment, it's easy to start thinking and doubting yourself while you're not getting on the pitch and you start questioning, oh, maybe I didn't do as well as I thought. And, but when you look back at it, I think he was young. It probably weren't the right time to be playing every single week in such a physical league. So I think when you focus on what you can control in terms of training and and gym and fitness and time with family and just being happy, you just, and then it will come. And then obviously I started playing a couple more games after that and, and I was happy and I was enjoying it. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about a different aspect of, of your career now. Um, I used to share a, a room on away trips with Neil Taylor quite a long time ago. Now I'm old. Um, but in 2015, he was named Asian footballer of the year. He's also spoke quite openly about his confusion as to why there isn't more British Asian footballers playing at a higher level. Um, you know, having a British Indian background yourself, um, and I've read articles you've been involved in where, you know, you share the difficult um, experiences you've had due to racism. Um, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, can you share a little bit with us those experiences that you've had and, and how you've managed to deal with them? Yeah, so... When I was younger, I had a bit of racism and from, obviously I was a kid and it was all the kids saying, saying comments and sometimes parents saying comments, he, he won't, because like I said, I was always the, the best in my age group, if not one of them growing up. So other kids, obviously kids are just, are just kids and, and they don't like someone being better than them and, and would say stuff, but. When I was young, it, it never affected me. It was I knew I was good, and I would just try and prove them wrong or not make them or score a goal to just have the last laugh, and it wouldn't. It would never affect me, and I think that's because I've had such a supportive family, and they've always stuck by me. That I didn't even now to this day. I don't care what anyone thinks, apart from my family. And if someone says I'm the worst player in the world, I don't care. But if my mom or dad say it, then it's it's gonna it's gonna hurt me. Do you know? So from young and Till now, I don't. I have never cared about what people think, and so when I was young, I, de I dealt with it well. It didn't phase me. I never 
went in went into it too much and it didn't affect me and I think that that's good because some people it can affect and I think like it's okay to be affected because when you're super proud of where you're from like I am you can can be affected but for some reason when I was young it just never affected me people would say there's no Asian players what makes you think that you can do it or obviously racial terms just being thrown at you and stuff like that so it was tough but it weren't every single week I was playing but every now and again you'd experience it because it, it weren't normal to see an Asian kid playing football let alone being the, the best on the pitch so people didn't like it and it never affected me but obviously recently I had <coughs> a bit of racism on my social media and that affected me a lot more than when I was a kid and I think the the reason behind that is because I'd done so much for speaking about Asians in football and I think you can tell how proud I am of where I come from and who my family is and, and who I represent that that's why it affected me so much because in this day and age now it shouldn't be happening and people shouldn't be seen for where they're from or who they represent or their background and that's why it affected me so much because I'm one of very few Asian players. I didn't really have anyone in the changing room to turn to. I don't live with my family, so I never had them to, to go home and speak to or hug my mum or hug my dad. And I think that's why it affected me so much. When I was little, I had my family with me. I had, I'd go home with my mum and dad. And, but here I had no one who was like me. I had no one to turn to. I had no family here. The only thing I could do was was FaceTime my family and speak to them, which which made me obviously feel better, but it's not the same as chilling with your mum or dad or brother or sister. So, yeah, it was difficult and it did affect me for a couple of days. But after that, like I said, uh, I couldn't control it. Uh, I couldn't control what people are saying to me. And ultimately, it was just using it as fuel to make myself better and, and prove these people wrong and make them even more jealous. And maybe it's because... I'm doing what I love and I'm and I'm standing up for what's right and these people don't like it. And the thing that affected me the most was how in 2021 it's still happening and everything that's gone on in terms of racism in football and, and taking the knee and people are still taking effort to, to make someone feel bad about where they're from and who they represent. So yeah, it was difficult, but I got through it. I am um, not only do you speak incredibly well about it, but I th you know I think what's as as well as that, you're an incredible role model for for people who who maybe aren't on a platform to to talk about it. Um, how did you manage to? You know, I think it's incredible that your your way of dealing with it is to is that I want to prove people wrong, and you know I I I'm going to use that to to help me to become better. Um, do you have any advice for, for people obviously maybe experiencing the same things? Uh, you know, we've spoke about that there's a few young Indian, um, you know, British Indian footballers. Do you have any advice for, for these young guys who want to replicate your path um, that might be finding that difficult? Yeah, I think it's easier said than done, but obviously to have the self-belief and the confidence because at times people are not going to think you're good. People are not going to believe in you and People are going to think you're rubbish, but ultimately I think it's just focusing on whose opinion matters and for me it's my family and, and that's it and I don't care what anyone else thinks, like I've said. So I think young people growing up, you have to realise what's important and whose opinion is, is most important and whose opinion you're going to let affect who you are. And I think it, if, if people are being racist of where you're from, and it's not just for young Asians in football but anyone who's experiencing racism I think that firstly I think it's okay to be upset and, and angry because I was I was upset and, and I was annoyed and I was hurt by it and I think that's okay but like I said at some point after it you have to realise that it's been said people think like this it sadly it might not be the last time you experience it but just growing through it and, and using it as as something that's going to make you better. And for me, it was proving them wrong, but for other people, it might be something com completely different. But ultimately, I think you have to try and turn the negative 
into a positive and, and using it as fuel to make yourself a better person and growing from it. And I think anyone growing up experiencing racism should never have to go through it. But the world we live in, you might do. And the most important thing is just not letting it affect you too much and, and just making a decision of, of what you're going to do about it and how you're going to use it to make yourself better, really, because that's ultimately all you can you can gain from it. I mean, you know, I am sorry that that's something you have to deal with. Um, and I've known you've been out there, obviously, to India. I've watched the, you know, the videos that you've done of, of you sharing your experiences over there. How aware of you are you of, you know, the, you know, the role model that you are to, to these football fans over there? Um, and how does that make you feel? Uh, honestly, I I went to India the first time two years ago, and I knew growing up and before I went to India that there was a lot of Indian fans and people who followed me, and 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 I knew who I represented and and what I was who I was doing it for, really making them proud, but. I think going to India two years ago for the first time with, with my dad and, and my friends was honestly the best thing I've ever done. I, I didn't actually realise how big it was and how many people were supporting me and how many people even knew who I was. I went over there and there was millions of people who, who knew what I was and who were super proud of me. And like I said, that when the racism stuff did happen recently, I, I thought of who I represented and it was all those people. And that's something I use to to fuel me to make them even more proud to know that I've gone through this and I've come out of it stronger and, and better and like I said when I went there it's probably one of the best things I've ever done and ever experienced to go out there and spend time at schools and orphanages and like I said just putting a smile on people's faces was was making me happy and when I came back from that and pre-season started I was happy and and I knew that I was doing it for for so many people and so many people were proud of me and I had their backing and, and their support and honestly it meant so much to me and I, I was meant to go again every year since then but obviously because of what's happened it's been difficult but as soon as it's safe to do so I'll, I'll go out there every year I think and try and talk to, to young people and young kids and not just kids who want to be footballers but I went to a, to an orphanage orphanage that was just all girls and there was left on the floor outside the orphanage because the parents did, didn't want them because there was girls and I think that's one of the best days I've ever had even in terms of scoring on my debut and just seeing those kids and spent about three or four hours with them and it was like it was the happiest day of their life and that's one thing that, that I'm desperate to go and do again because making all them kids smile and making their a year really not just a day but it was it was honestly one of the best things i've ever done and knowing that i can go there and do that is is amazing that's a powerful message the um some of the clubs over there are like heavily supported aren't they they yeah. get more fans than premier league clubs yeah, there's some teams over there get eighty thousand, ninety thousand 90,000 each game and football over there is so big and that's just what m makes people happy it's going over there watching football and just enjoying themselves and I'd love to go over there and go to a match, but when I went there, I didn't have chance. So maybe in the future. Yeah. The um, you've unfortunately experienced the worst of social media, um, and social media in modern day football is obviously it's you know it's pretty big. Um, I myself, I've sort of grown up. I was a bit of an anxious footballer um, when I was younger, and social media was just starting, and I was playing, and I, you know, felt good or or bad about myself, whatever. I would seek out social media and I would see oh, what people are saying about me positive would make me feel good negative I would I would really struggle with um is there do you find it difficult um to deal with social media and and do you read things about yourself online um and I know obviously uh, the theme of of what we're talking about is self-belief but is social media something that can damage that or or do you f have you found a way to, to deal with it um I think that on social media, it's how much you want to look at things. I think, like I said, some people are going to say you're the worst player in the world, and some people are going to think you're the best player in the world. And obviously, when you've got people supporting you, you really appreciate it. And 
and stuff like that and and you you care what people think and you care about their opinions but I think it's choosing the people who you really care about and who you're going to listen to I think on social media it's 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 way too easy for people to say whatever they want and not just in terms of racism and but in terms of someone's performance and how people play and people people think it's all right to to just write whatever they want and abuse whoever they want and ultimately it's deciding whose opinion you actually care about and for me it's my family so anyone else can say whatever they want about me I think but people on social media and people watching football need to realize that nobody goes on the pitch meaning to play bad nobody goes on the pitch meaning to make a mistake and I think because they're watching the game they think that they can write whatever they want which is which is ultimately it's up to them but I think if it's not just footballers, it's all sports people that can get abused. Anyone on TV can get abused because they're on TV and people are watching it. And, and ultimately, if we was watching these people doing their jobs, I'm sure we would have an opinion on them as well and, and they wouldn't like it. But people on social media just I think that they think it's funny or good to, to hurt people's feelings and write whatever they want. But I think that they need to actually think of what it actually does to the person if they see it and how it's going to affect them and it can affect people mental health going through depression and stuff like that and I think people need to to see the the bigger picture and not just writing whatever they feel like because it's not right really and I think that there's a lot of negativity on social media and, and people just doing whatever they might get a buzz out of it and they might think oh I've said this to this person and it's affected them and I don't understand how people work and what they're going to actually benefit from from making someone feel down about themselves but ultimately for me it's choosing who whose opinion you care about and people can write whatever they want about me on social media I'm not going to care but like I said if my family have an opinion then that's when I'm going to sit down and, and, and really think about what they've said but anyone else then you just brush it off really and that's my advice to anyone else who's, who's experiencing it. Yeah, my um, when I was young, my uh, so I, like I did, I got to a point where I wasn't looking anymore because I, I knew if I saw anybody that had said, "Oh, he's not very good," it would, you know, it would affect me. Um, and so I, I, I played this one game. I always remember it. I played this one game and I felt good. Felt like I had a good game. And uh, and I got home and, and my dad's there and he's saying, "Oh, how do how do you think that you played?" Blah blah blah. I said, "Yeah, like genuinely, I, I thought I was really good today." He said, oh, such and such online didn't think you were very good. I was like, Dad, what are you doing to yeah. me? Like, I'm not, I don't want you to read this stuff. Um, but no, that's, that's, you know, a powerful message, mate, of, of I think on, your advice. On social media, it's, you see people giving opinions who have nothing to do with football. I'm sure if their opinion was so, was so good and their thoughts were so good, then there'd be a, there'd be a manager or they'd be playing on the pitch. So I'm not really too sure, like, what people think think when they're they're writing messages like that, and I don't see why people like, read their messages and and let it affect them. Because ultimately, if their opinion mattered that much, I'm sure they'd yeah. they'd be higher up in football, or they'd be on TV, or they'd be a pundit, or they'd be a, be playing the game. So normally, it's people who have a picture of a, a crocodile as the as the as the picture, and they've got two followers and they've just made an account to literally abuse people because that's what they get a buzz out of so I think it's important to to just choose what what you want to want to read and obviously sometimes you can't you can't help but see if if people have directly tweeted it to you but I think the main the main thing is to choose whose opinion you actually value and who you're going to let affect affect your performance of of all the things that I was reading and, and watching a, about that you've been involved in one of the the things that i found that was quite unique in especially in a modern game that doesn't often happen is is you know people have um ambition and and they keep it within they don't say it out loud and usually people say saying things out loud is you know the law of attraction things may may happen uh, positive things may happen off the back of saying it out loud um so you said pretty publicly that you have ambition to win the Ballon d'Or, the Champions League and the Premier League, which is unique. That's not something often that, that young players are, are confident enough about saying out loud. 
Um, how much courage do you think it takes for you to, you know, to say that? And, and what do you think that does? Yeah, I think it takes courage, but obviously I'm young. I'm, ever since I was a kid, I've, I've dreamt of these things. And I think to have smaller goals is good for short term. But I think ultimately you have to set yourself the biggest targets because until then you're never going to be happy. And you can set yourself a target of, I don't know, playing 20 professional games. But then when you get to... When you get to 20 professional games, ultimately you, you might get complacent and think, oh, I've done what I needed to do. Like Everything else now is a bonus. Whereas for me, it's I think you have to work every single day and work on yourself physically, mentally, technically, and, and just keep improving. And I think until you, you've achieved as much as possible, I think then you have to just keep on working. And I think if you set yourself the biggest targets in football you have no reason to to get slack or to not to not keep working hard and I think I set myself the the biggest targets in football because I'm going to ultimately keep working every day to get as close as I can to that and that's a, a main thing for me and I think I have got a lot of small targets on the way and I think it's important to, to aim to hit them first and, and gradually take the steps up but yeah, I think if you set yourself big targets and high ceilings, then you got to keep working every day until until you get there. Have you ever heard the Casper Schmeichel story of him of him doing that? No. He um, so he he told his dad like, "I I want to win the Premier League," and his dad said to him like, "Oh, but that's just between us. Like, you, you like if if that's what you really want to do, you should say it out loud." And um, and so he said he went back to his old school. And in front of us, I think he was only playing at Notts County or somewhere at the time. So it was, at that time, it was pretty unique to say that out loud. And he went to his old, own old school and said in the assembly, like, I'm going to win the Premier League. And said it w- with a bit of confidence um, and said that, that that one focus, that one goal, obviously resonated with him for a long period of time until he was in the Leicester team, ultimately the, the one Premier League. But he said by saying it out loud, he felt more responsible of, of everything that he was doing than just having it in his mind quietly, um, sitting in the back of his head. Yeah, I think like for me, obviously, I want to win the Premier League. I want to play in the Champions League. I want to do all that. And I think you shouldn't have no shame in saying it out loud. I think if that's something that you're working for every day, then that's everyone's dream. And I think everyone in the world is, is thinking it and that's what they want to do. And I think ultimately you, you're working every day to do that. It's what you've dreamt for as a kid. It's what you've worked every single day of your life or it's what you moved away from home for it's it's everything really and I think if you set yourself the big targets then you got to work every day till you get there and I'm sure obviously now you said Kashmir Michael said it and that's what he wanted to do he's, he's worked every single day to do it and like like you said I'm I'm a believer of the law of attraction I'm a believer of everything happens for a reason and I think if you if you put in in, in the work and and working on yourself every single day then as long as you're doing that, you can have no regrets and anything that comes after that is, is a bonus. We're going to finish, mate, with some quick fire questions. I'm just going to fire them at you and see what you've got. Um, the first one is your best moment. In football? football. Uh, definitely celebrating, not just the goal, but celebrating with, with my dad and, and my cousin, not obviously my best mate. So, um, Worst moment? Probably losing in the playoff semi final last year is definitely obviously you're so close to going up to the Premier League and then you win the first leg and then the second leg you're losing and you're out and literally that's it, your season's done. So that's probably the worst moment I've had so far in, in, in football. Um best player you've played with? With uh Trent, I think what he's gone on to do now is speaks for itself. Yeah, so, he's and he's talented, one of my close friend, so yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, best player you've played against? Um, uh, Danny Ings, I've played against him, I'm with him, so yeah, it was definitely better playing with him. Um, biggest regret. 
if any? Um, I think looking back on it now, it would be trying harder for my family to move to Liverpool with me. I think at the time I was just, I didn't even think about asking. I just wanted to go and that was it. And if I could look back now, I think I'd try harder to get them to have moved up to Liverpool with me. But at the time, my brother was in school and it weren't fair for him to have to move school at, at 10 years old or whatever he was. So, yeah, I think it's not a regret, but that's something I'd have yeah. tried harder for it to happen. Um, best advice you've ever received? Uh, best advice is probably from a close family friend who I speak to now every single day and he's the one who told me to not go into one and overthink with stuff that you can't control because that's what's going to gonna beat you up and, and that he told me that uh, about five years ago not to overthink and think about things that you can't control and that's the best advice I've had because ever since then I've only really focused on stuff that's in my control and making myself better and, and improving. So, yeah, that was probably the best advice I've had. Um, best atmosphere you've played in? Um, that I've played in probably last year leads away. Obviously, it was full. The fans were there. They're obviously a loud set of fans and we won 1-0, so, yeah, and the celebrations when we scored was good, so, and Swansea fans when we did score were going crazy, so, yeah, definitely leads away last year. Um, career ambition? I've spoken about it a little bit, but... Uh, yeah, I think to play in the Premier League, to play in the Champions League and really just do everything I've dreamed of when I was a kid, represent England or India, whoever I... I choose to represent and hopefully play in the World Cup. Um, and lastly, the best advice that you've got to give to young players who want to become a professional footballer? Uh, firstly, what we've spoke about a lot today is deciding whose opinions matter most and which one you're going to give the energy to. Uh, and secondly, the advice that I got from a very close family friend which I spoke about was to not go into one with things that you can't control and literally only focusing on what's in your control and how you're going to make yourself better and what you can improve on. That's it. Amazing. Yeah, and thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I thought the insight we got from Jan about how self-belief can have such a positive impact on your football was amazing. His experiences should hopefully give any player at any stage of their career a lot to think about. To get a summary of all the valuable takeaways from today's episode, make sure you follow the show notes or head straight to the ePerform website. We will give you the key moments from each episode and put them into a clear roadmap of how to include the information straight into your game. Don't forget, if you like our content and want to see more, please write us a review, leave us a comment and please subscribe. Alternatively, head to the website and sign up to our mailing list to receive world-class information straight to your inbox every week or free to help leave no doubt in your game. Thank you once again to Jan for joining me and giving us an insight into some of the key moments of his career. See you all next week for another great episode that I can't wait to share with you all. I've been Joe Partington. See you guys soon.